1994 was a busy year for a lot of chasers, but it was slim pickings. April 25th, seen here, was the big chase event, and it brought tornadoes to South Dallas. The next day, there were more tornadoes in the Red River Valley. I only caught one near Abilene on May 29th. In fact, that year I saw more wildlife than anything. One big event that escaped all storm chasers was the Lahoma storm of August 17th. In fact, nobody expected it, not the local offices and not even SPC. And there's the morning forecast for Lahoma there in Garfield County. No chances of rain in the forecast. The morning update at 7 o'clock did add a 20% chance during the morning, though, then mostly sunny during the afternoon. So you can imagine if you're outside and you've got clear skies, you're in Lahoma here, you look to the north, and there's this thing coming at you. <laughs> and to be fair, SPC didn't get it either. This is the convective outlook that was issued that morning at about 7. So my point here is not to talk about how they got the forecast wrong, but to focus on exactly how this happened. Because there's a lot to be learned from case studies like this one. Let's start out with the infrared satellite imagery that day. This is at 5 in the morning and we're seeing this very large area of Altacumulus and Cirrus moving through northern Kansas. This is mostly elevated clouds, and what I want you to watch is this area here, north of Russell and Hayes. If we skip forward, 6 to 7 in the morning, watch this area here north of Russell. You'll see a storm come together right there, and then we have another one developing right here north of I-70. And there we go, right there near Russell. And watch what happens on the next frame at 11.30 in the morning. Get a much colder cloud top there. This was not forecast to move all the way down into Oklahoma, but it did. So now we're going to switch over to the visible imagery and look at things about 9 or 10 in the morning. So here's this area of clouds and uh, elevated convection. So we see this one little cell here southeast of Russell, but watch right here. You'll see uh, this one cell come together. This moves over the Russell area. The next hour, we see it really come together here in the Great Bend area. An hour later, starting to look a little bit stronger there. Bases are probably lowering at this time. So here's a close-up look at the storm at 11 in the morning. Pratt is located right here, Wichita is located here, and the main updraft is located right there. Move that forward one hour. You can see it's starting to look a little bit stronger. Edges are starting to look, to look a whole lot more defined. This is moving through roughly, let's see, where would that be? That would be the Kingman area. Kingman located right there. And then the next hour, going from 1 to 2 o'clock, there it is coming across the Kansas-Oklahoma border. And we can look at the plots with uh, my own digital atmosphere program, and it looks like this. You can see the dew points are not especially high over Oklahoma. If we do an isodrosotherm analysis, this is for uh, 10 in the morning. It's going to look, look like this. So I went ahead and did that dew point analysis and you can see the higher dew points are down to the south 67 to 68 down there and then down in Oklahoma and central Kansas we're looking at a lot of 
mid and upper 50s and a few lower 60s. But I wanted to show you this one plot. This is from the Oklahoma Mesonet. This is at 7 in the morning. One thing you do notice is that the winds are slightly to the east here and a little bit more southeasterly here. So that makes me wonder if there might be a small boundary in here. Also looking strictly at the dew point field, you can see a dew point transition from 62, 63, 64 here to 57, 56 here. That suggests that there may be a bit of an air mass transition right through here around the Arbuckles, around Ardmore, kind of in that area. Maybe some of that extends to the north, I don't know. This is the reason that very careful surface analysis is so critical because uh, if you identify exactly where, say, a convergence line is, that can make all the difference in identifying where initiation takes place. Okay, we're looking at the 500 millibar chart here with digital atmosphere, showing the northwesterly flow here, and some evidence of a short wave in that area between Kansas and Denver. This isn't going to be a very good picture as far as wh exactly where the short waves are. We don't have the benefit of model data, a first guess field, that kind of thing. But uh, we can assume there's probably something right in this area, and the satellite data does confirm that. 250 millibar flow looking like this. You can see we've got a bit of a jet stream. Okay, we add the height field on, and we can see there is a bit of a jet stream coming in from the northwest. So, yeah, this is a northwest flow situation for sure. Here's the sounding for Oklahoma City from 12Z. Showing a little bit of a moist layer right there in the lowest uh, 2,000 feet or so. We need to modify this for the afternoon conditions, so that means drawing a new temperature line that's going to run something like that and then we don't quite know the moisture it did increase up to 19 Celsius later in the morning by early afternoon so probably modify it like that which gives us a lifted parcel like this and there we go now you notice there's not a whole lot of cape up here in the mid levels but we have to keep in mind that when we were looking at the the uh, at the satellite, we saw that a lot of the destabilization, a lot of the shortwave energy, was centered in northern Kansas, and that's pretty far from the Oklahoma City radar site or radio sonde site. So more than likely, we've probably got some upper level cooling that's involved later in the day, especially up north near uh, the state line. So that's probably increased the cape a little bit. So you kind of have to put all these things together as you do your analysis picture and kind of think about all the things that are affecting your sounding as the day goes on. All right, so we're looking at the WSR-88D at Wichita, 1130 in the morning. And there's our storm right there in the Great Bend area. Run the frames forward. The storm just barrels straight southeast and by 1.30 p.m. located right there on the state line. So as the storm crosses the state line, it's starting to become severe. We don't have the benefit of the Enid radar yet because the radar has not been commissioned yet. It's only 1994. The velocity, let's check that out. We're going to look at the base velocity because that's ground relative velocity. The values it's showing are on the order of about 20 to 30 knots, so nothing too strong. But as we move forward, we start developing some very strong velocities. We're now getting 53 knots outbound, so a component away from the radar like that. But you can see we're starting to get into a range-folded area. This is uh, starting to get too far from the radar. 
so we don't have a whole lot to go on. However, we can switch to the Oklahoma City radar. Let's do that. So here's the Twin Lakes radar. We can see that the storm is kind of degraded here, definitely. But it is starting to show a little bit of a supercellular structure. We run this forward. And we're getting on the order of maybe 30 to 40 knots inbound as it passes over Enid, the, actually the radar site Enid. It's going to be in the Medford area. And it continues moving south. You can see all the range folded degradation. And now we start to pick up some higher velocities right around here. We have a corrupt radial right here. I guess it's not being de-aliased very well. But this little spot right here we're getting 67 knots inbound towards the radar. And our storm is starting to look pretty good. Starting to look like a supercell there. Updraft area located right there. And we go up to higher tilts. Look at, look at that overhang. Set a dot right there in the middle of that overhang. This is up at uh, 50,000 feet. See that down here? Look at that, 50 to 52. And if we go down to lower tilts, we can see that's right over the updraft area. So even without the velocity information, we know that that's a very potent storm. And where is Lahoma? Right there. Right in the... Uh, right in the uh, line of the storm. Now the main problem is that we are 7,000 feet off the ground, which is not good for sampling a downdraft. So take for example the model of a severe, or the model of a thunderstorm. 10,000 feet, that's going to be about 3 kilometers. Are we sampling the outflow? not very well at that level. We want to get as low to the ground as we can. So that's not working out too well for us with this setup. So we're very dependent on spotter reports, any mesonet data, which fortunately we did have at the time, and of course any media reports, whatever you can get. So about the uh, peak, uh, yeah, there's the animation right there. About the peak velocity, the peak velocities we saw on the radar were probably about right here. We've got about 70 to 80 knots inbound, and that's it right there. But this is probably a good strong RFD, and by RFD we're talking about uh, we're probably looking at a meso probably looking at a mesocyclone right there. So we're probably looking at a mesocyclone in this updraft area. And the side of the storm where the cyclonic... So we've got a mesocyclone likely right here in this updraft area. And it's on the west side where the forward motion combines with a counterclockwise spin of the meso, and that's where we get an exceptionally strong uh, surface wind. And that's where La Homa happens to be, is right there. Located right there, so they got the brunt of the outflow from the storm. And then afterwards, the uh, storm did kind of weaken a little bit. You can see not quite as potent there at uh, 3 o'clock as it looked earlier. Here's the uh, meteograms for Lahoma from the Oklahoma Mesonet. You can see that the rain started in 1945. These lines are about every tenth of an inch right here. So a little bit of rain initially, 1945 to 1950, and then it got very heavy after that. So what did it feel like 
right there at La Homa. Well, remember the rain started about right here and really picked up right around here. So over here on the left, this is going to be, I've overprinted the uh, speed in miles per hour. So we had winds out of the south, yeah, out of the south-southeast. They were at about 10 miles an hour, gusting to about 25. And then as the rain started setting in, We saw the uh, sustained winds at 45 miles an hour increasing to about 87. And then five minutes later, they were sustained at about 75 miles an hour, gusting to 113 miles an hour. So that was quite a, you know, we're talking maybe category one hurricane strength. And then we saw it slowly dying off over the next uh, 15 minutes or so. News OK reported the storm, 113 miles an hour, strips trees, ruined 28 residences. And they've got a news story here you can view on their website. 25 mobile homes destroyed, three single family residences, 70 homes received minor to extensive damage. The, uh, the town was without power and telephone service that night, down lines on the highway. There's a thread on the uh, StormTrack website, stormtrack.org. You can read that. It's in the Advanced Weather and Chasing section. Got uh, Jonathan Whitehead and Shane Adams. Robert Satka is talking about their memories of the storm. All right, so there you go. That's the Big Lahoma storm. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll probably do a few more of these uh, freak thunderstorm presentations. I certainly know a whole bunch more that we can go over, so maybe we'll think about doing that. So anyway, thanks for watching, and I hope you will like this video and subscribe and leave some feedback if you get a chance. And check out the evening webcast at 8 Central, 9 Eastern. I hope I see you there.